Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. We're going to talk about isolationism and look at whether it may be gaining ground. My co-host, Tim Apicella, and our special esteemed guest, Gene Rosenfeld. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. Morning. So we've seen a thread of isolationism, you know, coming through the Republican Party. It hasn't stopped Joe Biden in his efforts, uh, although it seems to have slowed down the funding, especially for Ukraine. And so the question is to look at where it's going politically in this country to see what isolationism means, uh, how prominent it is now, how prominent it is likely to be, and who's leading that particular mm, phenomenon. Uh, Gene, you spotted an article. Um, and by a fellow named Christopher McCallion, um, which has been reported here and there, and uh, it is of some concern. So, Gene, can you tell us? Can you tell us the four corners of that article, and then we can discuss what it signifies and where it's likely to go. Well, uh, in terms of this discussion, I'll make it very brief, but I will write, and perhaps you may post an article based on his points and my attempted refutation of them. <laughs> Christopher McCallion uh, apparently was hired by a think tank established by libertarians, specifically Rand and Ron Paul, with the backing of billionaire uh, Charles Koch in 2016. Uh, he was hired from, uh, apparently his only position has been a three-year, three-and-a-half-year position at Hunter College as an adjunct lecturer, which is like a junior academic just starting out, historian. Um, he writes persuasively and supposedly in a moderate tone, and he advances points against American current foreign policy, which could be extremely damaging to the United States down the line, but which have a rhetorical appeal to a large segment of the uh, American electorate who are becoming weary of war stories and who would like the United States to spend its money domestically on uh, the, the various issues and problems that we have. Now, no one can argue with that. However, withdrawing from our position of a uh, primary superpower in the world is a very dangerous position to take at a time when China and Russia are united in being more aggressive than they have been um, for many years. Uh, his points are directly in line with what Putin has ad advanced at his Valdai Club conferences, which are held to attract unaligned nations. Remember that China and Russia together have potential influence and control over 40% of the world's population. They are making advances in Latin America, in, uh, in, in Africa, in the South Pacific. And China has been more aggressive than one would expect in taking over actual maritime territory in the South China Sea through a trade route that controls one third of the world's trade, while Russia has been building military bases in the Arctic, which is warming up and is a potential trade route that it's sharing with China over one half of the territory in the Arctic. This is background to McCallion's very naive statements that our distance from Eurasia is going to make us secure. We can withdraw from the Middle East. We can withdraw from our uh, Pacific alliances uh, into the secure bastion of the United States. Now that was fine in 1830, but today with the development of the delivery by hypersonic missiles of uh, nuclear weapons and Russia and China's advances in cyber space and in actual satellite space, that is a ridiculous uh, assumption. We cannot withdraw from the world. We are part of the world. And we need to recognize that the idea that we could withdraw our support from Ukraine and from Israel 
in those vital areas where Russia is aggressing against Eastern Europe and uh, is aligned with Iran in aggressing against the Sunni Arabs in the Middle East who are trying to make agreements with Israel is ridiculous. A second ridiculous assumption that he makes and this uh, think tank that the Cox and uh, <clears throat> that uh, the Pauls uh, established is that we can withdraw from the Middle East and from our alignment with Israel, that Israel can defend itself uh, against uh, all of the uh, powers aligned against it, backed by Russia, um, if we withdraw from uh, Israel. Uh, and, and given the fact that Gaza, uh, ruled by Hamas, has actually started a war that it's planned for two years with the knowledge of Iran, which is backed by Russia, I don't see how our withdrawal could contribute to regional stability when our presence there has actually enabled Israel to make peace agreements with Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. So these assumptions that somehow Western Europe can support itself against Russian energy aggression, which was well on its way to controlling politics in Western Europe, and against Russian actual aggression in Ukraine, when Ukraine established its bona fides by electing democratically uh, a president and overthrowing a Russian puppet, I just don't see how this libertarian think tank uh, can come up with a foreign policy in alignment with Russia that is going to make the United States more secure, the world more stable, and um, ourselves more safe. Mm. So, Tim, um, as Jean said, this would appeal to um, you know, an existing thread uh, within the MAGA <clears throat> GOP, but it would also appeal to the, the left-wing liberals, too. It's, it's both sides of the extremes um, that are the target of this article and this initiative, which is called the, what, Defense Priority Initiative. That's the name of the think tank they've created. Uh, so, uh, a query, um, you know, does that properly reach both sides, both extremes? Is that likely to gain traction in this country? Well, I think to some degree with the mega GOP, uh, as you said, it, it has. And thanks to Donald Trump uh, initiating these concepts back when he first became president with trying to shake NATO down to its foundations and um, threatening uh, withdrawal from NATO and its support, um, threatening all the nations um, that they better pay their, pay their fair share or else. Uh, that was the spark, I thought, when, I, when it occurred that... Uh, he was introducing the concept of isolation, isolationism, and um, certainly has since then. And and you know the the big the big push, and you've heard this from um, um, Taylor Green, Congresswoman Taylor Green, about um, we need to stop supporting Ukraine because we need to take care of America first, specifically down at the southern border. Uh, that has always had a an echo within the United States. America first take care of America before we send money to other foreign nations, either for military defense or humanitarian reasons. Uh, talk to any very conservative GOP person, and that comes up in their, their discourse. America first, and um, forget about uh, other nations. So as far as on the liberal side, I, I don't have a pulse on that market. I, I don't know if, if this concept will appeal. Um, you know, they may be so far extreme that... They're they're right where the uh, mega GOP is on this issue. I just really don't have a feel for that, Jay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know it's it's very ironic that um, the article um, and the GOP mantra is that we ought to uh, uh, deal with domestic issues first. But they're the ones who have blocked uh, any legislation to solve any of those those issues. They've locked up Congress. Well, that's the hypocrisy of it all. <laughs> tremendous hypocrisy. So, but talking about, you know, hypocrisy, Gene, you have Koch, Charles Koch, the survivor of the Koch brothers, uh, you know, who just a couple of days ago 
um, put his uh, approval on uh, Nikki Haley. And Nikki Haley has said, as part of her platform, that she will support aid uh, to both Ukraine and Israel. So here's Charles Koch uh, supporting a candidate who takes that position. At the same moment, he's uh, behind this um, you know, defense priorities think tank, uh, which has uh, uh, had McKillian uh, write this article and uh, advance the notion of isolationism. Can you, can you reconcile uh, those two steps by the same uh, Charles Koch? In a power sense, yes because they're backing a potential viable candidate for president at the same time they are backing a viable potential reversal of foreign policy uh, to appeal to younger conservatives. And it's the youth vote that they're after in uh, reestablishing a uh, newly aligned Republican Party. I don't think that billionaires are that um, advanced in their knowledge of foreign policy, that sophisticated or that concerned about it. I think they're mostly concerned with domestic power, and that means controlling the offices which govern the United States. Hmm. Well, we, you know, we, have, we have a hypocrisy going left and right, but uh, it seems to me from what Jean says that what they're doing is re, reforming, re, reorganizing the, uh, the, the Republican Party. That's what they want to do. They want to get a, a younger candidate in for president, uh, a woman candidate. Um, and as we discussed before the show, she the fact that she's a woman is not all that much of an impediment. The fact that she's Asian is not all that much an impediment. And they're trying to, you know, gain the diversity vote, if you will, and the people who would vote for women, if you will. Um, they're trying to reach a, a younger, uh, you know, uh, age group of, of the electorate. Uh, at the same time, they're taking a position that might appeal. Uh, let's let's get out of these uh, foreign engagements. Uh, uh, let's be pacifist. You know, peace is always good. I suggest that may appeal to uh, some of the voters on the on the left side of the spectrum. Peace is always good. Let's do peace. Um, but the question, you know, is. Uh, can they achieve, Tim, um, this reorganization in the face of Trump's numbers in the polls? Yeah, I think they can. Um, I, you know, again, it, it, the root of the the root of all evil is the love of money, and uh, the more money, the more you can influence through social media, um, to direct mailers, ads, doorbell knocking, you know, um, it just takes resources. And resources can certainly shape public opinion. And it just depends on what organization wants to dedicate how much of their resource to the formation of a change of attitude or a value. Uh, or in the case of politics now, belief system. But uh, nevertheless, all, all three attitudes, values, and beliefs can be changed with proper, I won't say propaganda, but with proper media attention. So the answer is yes. Yeah, speaking of media, I'm, I recall there's, a, there's an article in uh, today's uh, Times um, to the effect that uh, Joe Biden, who has been um, trying to get the social media companies um, to uh, avoid disinformation, especially from Putin from overseas, so we don't have uh, a recurrence of what happened in 2016, in the November election, um, he was stopped, and I don't know the status of the case, by some Louisiana judge a couple of months ago uh, from doing this more formally. But he's been, in fact, doing it informally, talking to um, these various social media executives and asking them to be really careful about accepting this information. But the article in the paper today was really interesting. He has, on his own motion, stop doing that. He isn't approaching them anymore. He decided not to. This is not a judicial edict or anything. He decided not to, uh, you know, try to stop them uh, in um, efforts to uh, avoid disinformation from outside the country. And uh, I find that extraordinary. The reason given was that, um, it, it uh, and maybe the reason given by organizations that would lobby against such a 
an effort by by the White House is that it 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 it, it, it it's not consistent with the First Amendment. That's one of the, some of the social media companies said that too. Your thoughts about this, you know, because what we have is um, we have Joe Biden backing off um, and being stopped also on efforts to avoid disinformation, including disinformation from Russia, who would like to see this isolationist uh, initiative succeed. The progressives are very concerned about their First Amendment rights, as all Americans should be. Uh, I think they're a little more sensitive to it. And I don't think they recognize the threat of, of, of Vladimir Putin and or, and or Russia and its influence on social media. They just see the main issue is that uh, government is, in, you know, inter trying to intercede in the social media platforms and trying to restrict uh, their First Amendment rights. So they're rearing up, if you will, uh, on that particular issue. Um, you know, Joe Biden has every right to say uh, disinformation is not healthy for this country. Uh, I'm sure that the progressive left would look at it as he's self-interested only in his reelection, and that's why he's doing it. Uh, I don't believe so. Look at look at uh, how disinformation took over on the uh, how we look at COVID and the treatment of, of COVID. Uh, million a million Americans died, and a lot of them died partly to misinformation, disinformation uh, directly spread through social media and Donald Trump. This is interesting because you know that the First Amendment argument appeals to the liberals. And yet, it's something that the right wing would like to see. They would like to be able to speak on social media and have Putin speak on social media as we get closer to the election. So all of these factors, uh, Gene, seem to to play in favor of of you know a, a greater attention to isolationism. And I don't know if Biden can stop that. What do you think? I'd like to put on my history hat for a minute, even though I'm not primarily a historian of uh, 20th century politics. I, I was have, hoping you would, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> I have lived through some of it, although this is a little bit earlier than my appearance on Earth. That is the 1930s. I am becoming increasingly alarmed at parallels, historical parallels with the 1930s. And I've said this before, we may be in 1938, we may be in 1939. Christopher McCallion brought this up himself in his article when he was talking about the Munich appeasement uh, argument that is, that is utilized to uh, support American military uh, involvement in the world. Uh, and I went back and looked a little bit at the Munich uh, situation. You remember that uh, uh, we gave Hitler what he wanted uh, in, I think it was 1938, when he was uh, demanding the Sudetenland, parts of Czechoslovakia with uh, German-speaking individuals. He wanted control over it. And the Allies said, yeah, okay, go ahead, thinking they could buy him off, just like Israel thought it could buy Hamas off before they recently attacked. And it didn't work. But we don't just use this argument for a one type of, of, of example or situation. Well before Hitler demanded the Sudetenland, he was already doing things that should have raised red flags, like remilitarizing the Rhineland. And, um, you know, like, like taking over other areas as well. We have now seen indications of Russian aggression since especially uh, 2014, uh, in terms of his grabbing Crimea, but he's also made aggressive moves in uh, <clears throat> adjacent areas like Moldova, Belarus. Obviously, he's taken over. He's a puppet in Belarus. He established a puppet in Ukraine who was overthrown, and that instigated the current aggression. He's uh, been um, aggressing in uh, against Armenia. He's been aggressing um, in Georgia. All of these things are red flags. He's acting like Hitler, unfortunately. And it isn't just a one-off with Munich. If we concede Ukraine to Russia, McCallion says, oh no, he's not going to aggress against the Baltic states and Poland. 
Well, maybe he doesn't need to aggress militarily, but he can aggress politically, given the right wing mood in some of those countries. And he can aggress in terms of energy. We now know that it's the Ukrainians that uh, that uh, sabotaged the Russian second Russian pipeline, energy pipeline to Europe. And that was a strong move. It's a move like Israel would like to make against Iran, but maybe they were seeing something we can't see. And that would be concession to uh, a weakening of NATO, uh, concession to Russian energy control over Western Europe, concession to Russian placing its puppets in its areas of uh, supposed um, control and hegemony all the while crying to the rest of the world that we have to get rid of American influence, that the yuan should replace the dollar, and that uh, China and Russia should build up their militaries, and uh, that we need to get rid of American hegemony because, as Pr Christopher McCallion echoes, we have done more to provoke them than what they have done to provoke us. Uh, of course, he doesn't give any specific examples. And it's an untenable argument. Uh, but he says framing this, as Biden does, in terms of autocracy for, versus democracy is the reason why they're provoked. Well, think about that for a moment. Who has aggressed against democracy? Well, it, yeah, it's extraordinary when, uh, when people say that um, the United States is responsible um, for Russia's aggression. We've had discussions of that on the yeah. show, uh, or that. Hey, Jay? That's, yes, please. You know, where we're on this topic of of history and isolationism back in the '30s in Germany, I guess I'd like to get Gene's responses. You know, when 2014, when you know Putin did go into Crimea, and the United States didn't respond quite nearly as forceful as it could have, but we certainly have now since the recent invasion of Ukraine, and I guess. Did the United States learn a lesson from 1939? Um, I mean, what would the world look like had on September 1st, 1939, when, when Germany invaded Poland, had the United States gotten very aggressive to, to fund uh, with military equipment France and, and England? What would war, World War II have looked like had we got in uh, then versus 1941? And I, I think it would have been a different war. I don't think it would have been as expansive as it did turn out to be, um, but we'll never know that. But um, here it is where, you know, being proactive in Ukraine was certainly better than just sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what would happen. And that's what isolation is all about, sitting on the sidelines, seeing how things will unfold. And, you know, you could pay now uh, for military aid for Ukraine, or you could pay 10 times more when there's a full-blown, you know, aggressive Russia. Um, invasion of other European nations. So pay now or pay more. Uh, Jay, can I respond to that? Because I think Tim has really hit the nail on the head. I think he's absolutely right. This is what deeply concerns me. In 1938-39, had we been able to rearm earlier, and by the way, Christopher McCallion thinks we should disarm rather than rearm, and that we couldn't, that we're using up our finite resources in Ukraine. He's, he's never lived long enough to understand how fast we reproduced arms once we got into World War II and what we can do when we need to. The fact is, isolationism and not uh, building up our armaments earlier in the face of Hitler's very obvious aggressions uh, actually did not save lives, it took lives. It did not. Uh, shorten a war, it prolonged a war. It was tragic. And it would be tragic if we did this again. And if we backed off from Ukraine and we backed off from the Middle East, if that happened, where would unaligned nations turn? And where would the pressures be? He says, you know, in Asia, if we stop uh, basically countering the moves that China is making in the South China Sea, or if we uh, didn't make those quad alliances and other things, uh, there would also be more stability and we would be more secure because after all, we have, we're between two oceans. 
again, that could have worked out in 1830, but it's not going to work out today. And the fact is that our withdrawal from um, foreign policy against aggression in the late 1930s was tragic. We need to raise the red flag again today because, unfortunately, McCallion's article appeared in CNN. And I think we have to engage when things like that happen, even with the risk of building a name for defense priorities. It's going to be, I think, uh, an appeal to a lot of young people who haven't lived long enough to learn the lessons that we had to learn then. And I must say this, one of the reasons why uh, Joe Biden's foreign policy is more effective than Donald Trump's is because Joe Biden remembers what happened in the 1930s and 40s. He got it straight from the horse's mouth, from his uncles and his, his father and from everybody else, just as I did. I mean, um, he, he really knows the score. And too many people have forgotten the score, and that enables them to be manipulated by these subtle arguments by uh, people like McCallion, who is really being horribly naive. Well, maybe more than naive, maybe he's getting instructions on what to say and how to say it. You know, as you mentioned, uh, it's he writes well, and um, I, I have this uh, sense that it went all through the Koch organization before it ever got published. Who knows wrote that? who wrote that? Anyway, Tim, uh, and, and for that matter, Gene, I want to ask you both the same question. That is, you know, what's the level of alarm here? Uh, you know, Putin, and I think of Putin primarily because he's mm, mm, more visible somehow, um, is running an, a, an asymmetrical war. It's not just the kinetics, you know, on the battlefield. It's not just the, the tanks and, and the drones and the missiles and all that. He's hacking. He's hacking into all the countries that Gene mentioned he's putting puppets wherever he can. He's trying to undermine, you know, Europe in general. That's part of his war. Um, and okay, and this is the, the the question. He's trying to undermine the United States in order to have us sort of leave the field. Um, he's he's done that with Trump. But God knows what compromise he has on Trump that would uh, make Trump uh, vulnerable to that. But Trump certainly has taken the position. That if elected on day one, he would terminate, um, you know, support of Ukraine. Mike Johnson, who works for Trump, has said pretty much the same thing. No support for Ukraine. Even if support for Israel, no support for Ukraine. And now we have this article in the Koch uh, brothers. And they're also talking about, you know, withdrawing any support of any of our uh, allies that are under contention right now. And I feel that we have 10 months to go. Joe Biden has 10 clear months uh, to continue his efforts, including dealing with the attacks by Iran and Syria. We read about that in today's news. Um, and um, if he, you know, and, and in doing that, he he has to contend with this, um, this movement, uh, this isolationist movement. And that movement may actually make him less popular. Uh, and that movement may cost him the election to either Trump or Nikki Haley. Um, and, and the result would be, at the end of the day, uh, Nikki Haley may change her position to more isolationist. Uh, Koch would like that. Uh, the GOP may go that way, and some liberals may go that way. So what is the level of alarm here? Uh, is this a five, a five alarm far, uh, a fire, or uh, is it something that will, will pass? Tim? I, I think all left left leaning democrats middle of the road democrats independents and moderate gop this is a 4.5 uh alarm and that is just to your point if donald trump becomes president again you can guarantee we'll be an isolationist nation he will get us out of nato he'll detract or retract from the united nations uh you can forget about ukraine support uh we will be an isolationist nation so to what degree is that an alarm 4.5 uh, you know, and, and even if Donald Trump doesn't use his influence right now on these on on isolationism, um, there will be other influencers. Uh, God knows where they'll come from. Uh, will they have popularity, fame? I mean, look at um, the 1920s and 30s. Who was the great influencer of isolationism back then? Charles Lindbergh. 
And uh, who's the next Charles Lindbergh in 2023? I don't know. But you can rest assured that there will be a continued movement for this, this, this feeling of isolationism. And they are going to go to the young minds that don't remember history or never were taught the history. So they will try to influence the younger minds, Gen Z, um, the millennials, and even, even some Gen X. Um, I think most boomers really do know their history about World War II and how that all came to be. But I don't want, I don't want to um, assume that. But uh, there you go. We're, we're in, as you like to say, Jay, we're in deep kimchi. <laughs> well, Gene, you know, um, you talk about history in the 30s, and I recall that in Radio City Music Hall in New York in the early 30s, say 33, 34, um, they had a, a Nazi rally, and, and like 10,000 people showed up. A few years later, and, 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 you know, gave the Hitler salute and all that, a few years later, they had another rally at Radio City Music Hall, and something way more, like 30,000 people were involved in the second rally. So the number of um, Nazis and Nazi sympathizers in the country grew, and their thing was stay out of what's going on in Europe. Uh, you know, Hitler's a good guy. Um, and they would have sought, they would have sought um, isolationism. They were seeking isolation, Lindbergh and all that. And were it not for Pearl Harbor, um, you know, our stance, you guys have both referred to this, our stance would have been entirely different. Pearl Harbor was the catalytic agent uh, for us, for Roosevelt, for the country. And it um, seems to me that um, if the Republicans get back in office, we will have a Republican, uh, you know, uh, uh, administration, and we will not have a leader like FDR. And we will not have a catalytic agent that will draw the United States, uh, you know, in, into the fray, or phrase as the case may be. So I'm, I'm pretty uh, worried. Um, how about you? Well, if I weren't worried, I wouldn't have brought the article to attention because the best thing to do with things like this is to let them just sort of die on the vine and not get the, the PR. Uh, <clears throat> The think tank, uh, which is Defense Priorities Foundation, has a has an arm of lobbyists. They now are lobbying, and I don't know how much influence they are having right now on members of Congress who are isolationist uh, in terms of you know the MAGA Republicans who are isolationist and want to get out of Ukraine, and the far far progressive ones who look at the United States as being uh, the main provocateur in um, late history with all the wars we have been involved in from Afghanistan. One of the major hires for um, defense priorities has been a fellow named uh, Ruger, who was the chief whistleblower in Afghanistan and wanted us out of Afghanistan. Uh, so he has, uh, he, he doesn't have the same view as McCallion, but He's on board. And I think they could put together a coalition politically in the country that would be as appealing as it was in the late 1930s. Now, of course, Pearl Harbor happened, but we have to remember that after Pearl Harbor, Germany also declared war on the United States. And eventually, it will arrive on our shores. So this is only a holding action by people who really have not paid attention to history and who have their own interests at heart. And um, in, in terms of gaining power and influence within the United States by taking over a major uh, political party and governing the judiciary system and governing uh, the major offices in the United States, Speaker of the House, President, and et cetera. I think we have to remember that charismatic leaders in a situation of polarization and high anxiety among an electorate, the charismatic leaders are very, very dangerous because people just want to put it on some father figure or mother figure who is going to take this fear away from them and make them feel secure. And the fact that defense priorities is using the word security and stability in, in league with American withdrawal is alarming. I'm not going to put a number on it, but I seem to have a facility <laughs> for finding things early on that are going to develop a constituency as we go and become front page news. 
Well, let's, uh, we're almost out of time. So I want to ask you guys for, uh, you know, uh, your final thoughts based on our discussion so far. And the question I would put to you to consider dealing with in your final thoughts is what should Joe Biden do between now and November? Uh, he's kind of in a dilemma. You know, the more overseas he goes, the more, you know, he tries to, you know, do aggressive foreign policy, um, the more um, he's going to be attacked by the GOP. And in any event, uh, the GOP and the isolationists, as Gene said, are really mm, getting it together and they're going to try to affect public opinion and the electorate uh, to sort of vote for isolationism. Whoever speaks for it in the campaign and in the election in November, what should Joe Biden do between now, now and then? Tim? Uh, very quickly, he should use the bully pulpit <clears throat> not to lecture the American public, but to educate them genteely and remind them what isolation has brought to the United States, uh, even before World War I, during, after World War I, certainly what led up to World War II. And, um, you know, basically remind people how we got into the mess that we got into and what Donald Trump's philosophy will br bring us uh, in the future to come. That's the one thing he can do. And then um, remind everybody that uh, he's still viable as a candidate and he's not, he's not too old to conduct the job and conduct world policy because right now credibility is everything for Joe Biden and he needs to increase his credibility so that his message gets out and is accepted. But without credibility, uh, it's just air and air in the wind. Yeah, and and people, everybody in the country has to see that if we are going to retain our uh, influence um, and and protect ourselves, uh, we're going to have to sacrifice. Um, you know, right now the country spends one hundred and fifty billion dollars on beer and chips. Uh, <laughs> We're going to have to make some sacrifices. So, Gene, what are your final comments? I think that Joe Biden's speeches recently have been an attempt to uh, educate the American public. I think that's why he's speaking out. He has a congenital stammering problem. He is not a good public speaker. But if you listen to what he has to say, he's a very wise man. One of the reasons why we made a mistake with Syria and allowing Russia to come in at that time that Obama made that mistake is because he's too young. Joe Biden is not too old. He's old enough to deal with these particular challenges, which the young are not able to deal with. And we need to reverse that argument and that campaign needs to make that argument. Secondly, you have to always counter someone who's coming up with these harebrained ideas. And remember, that Ron Paul is um, sort of a, a guy who is uh, an inmate in an asylum that's sort of taken it over, and he's aligned with a lot of very questionable ideas. He is not a wise man, and he's behind all of this. So you need to counter this type of misinformation by real information, loud and clear, repetitively. You have to engage the debate. You have to give the people a real choice while you're educating them. You have to make it very clear. And you have to reverse that age argument. I'm three years older than Joe Biden. I feel just fine when dealing with these things. And I know Joe Biden is too. And, you know, it's not how fast he walks or how he talks that matters. It's his thought processes and how he handles other leaders in the world. He just had a meeting with Xi Jinping, which I think was a very effective meeting and a very smart meeting to make. His out, the outreach to Xi Jinping was great in its timing right now and in its execution. Those are the things we have to look at. We have to look at how he behaves in his execution of things. And we have to get rid of all the rhetoric that is clouding the airwaves and listen to the main message. Because this is a wise man. We need his leadership. And there's nobody else on the horizon with the chops to do it right now. Uh, Gene Rosenberg, Tim Apicella, we're out of time. Thank you so much for this discussion. I can't say I feel better now, but I also feel that if, if necessary, Gene can run for president. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you.